Hello family, this is Pastor Gideon and this is Kingdom Matters. Today we are talking about the succession plans of ministries. Maybe you have seen some, it may also be your first time hearing of succession plans of ministry. We are talking about how ministries move from one leader to the other. Now in our last video, I said we were going to come at showing how ministers and ministries should learn how to plan their succession. Today we are going to look into two ministries succession plans one from ghana and the other from nigeria the one from ghana has had five successful leadership successions from the time of the founder onto the present and the one from nigeria is yet to have one but they also have a lay down process for succession the ministry from ghana is the church of pentacles it was founded 70 years ago exactly this year and currently operates in about 151 out of the 193 nations of the world with a current global membership estimated about 4.2 million according to their 2022 ministry report the ministry from nigeria is the living faith worldwide aka winners chapel and in this video i'll be using winners chapel a lot it was founded about 42 years ago and according to a 2014 report it currently operates in about 147 countries with over six million members now with the rate of growth of the ministry it is expected that these numbers would have doubled by the end of 2023 now if you're a pastor or a ministry leader a ministry leader who wants to bear enduring fruit the lord jesus said you have not chosen me or called me i have called you that you should bear fruit fruit that should remain now if you're a pastor or ministry leader who wants to bear enduring fruit the next things i discovered about these two ministries are things you must consider seriously now this video has taken me a while to make and for the past week i wasn't able to produce a video because i had to go through documents after documents take note that we are not discussing doctrines here you may not agree with them in doctrines that's fine and you may not even like the ministries involved but they are doing something right when it comes to succession plans and i want you to pay attention at the things we are going to look at now the first thing that stood out for me and it really ministered to me is the fact that both ministries have very well laid down structures and administrative guidelines that spells out every way the business of the ministry must be carried out i am not talking about just having a ministry constitution and then doing what you want no it is bigger and deeper than that if you want to have a look at these materials i'm going to leave them in my telegram channel when you go on telegram search out pastor gideon seabot in the same name with this channel you are going to find it. you'll find them there you can peruse them for yourself and learn a few things there in fact some of them are very voluminous now this document solves the problem of not knowing what to do at any point because everything is clearly stated and clearly spelled out there you will find everything in details such that if you take out the current crop of leaders of the churches and you hand over the document to any pastor trust me by the details in those documents they can start and run a winner's chapel or a church of Pentecost with no struggle at all and this is where many young ministries fail completely most of our young ministers run everything from the top of our head and so the moment god calls you the whole ministry comes to a standstill or it comes down crumbling founder and leader of a fellowship if you believe what you are doing is from god and worth being around for a long time especially if you know it must endure to the lord returns apart from trusting in the lord to keep it please take our time to document the vision the mission the order of the services the doctrines and every detail that accounts for the reason for the ministry of fellowship that you have document it and make it available for every member of the ministry keep refining and fine-tuning it till you get to the ultimate manual for the ministry start now and start documenting it i believe this is going to help you as we go deeper into what we are about to discuss now the second thing we will discover as i delve into the ministry succession plans of these two ministries is that they both have at least two councils for the purpose of helping the leader of the ministry stay affairs easily and also to help for accountability checks and balances it ensures that one man doesn't run all the shows of the ministry he works with other great men of the ministry to help them achieve their corporate goal now let's jump into our succession plans of these two ministries and we are going to start with the church of pentacle the way i'm going to approach it is to compare and to contrast the various structures of the two ministries and to point out the similarities and the differences as we roll on do you understand and the effects or the gaps that are left and what could happen 
in case of anything. Now let's construct the succession plans of the two ministries and learn from them. Now, the leader of the Church of Pentecost is called the chairman. Now, in the same vein, the leader of the Winners Chapel or Living Faith Church Worldwide is called the president. And he is the highest spiritual and administrative leader of the church worldwide. Now, what is the qualification for such leaders? In the Church of Pentecost, the leader shall be a minister, not below the office of an apostle or a prophet. Now, when you say apostle or prophet in the Church of Pentecost, these are not just normal titles. These are senior ministers who are consecrated to ordain other ministers of the church and to dedicate church facilities. With the Winners Chapel, he must have served pastoral ministry consistently for at least 20 years, plus he must have all the good examples around, and he will be nominated from the Council of Priests. Now, in Winners Chapel, when you say Council of Priests, you are talking about a certain level of seniority in the ministry. So it is maximum of 70 regional overseers, provincial pastors, and selected senior pastors across board. The numbers is about 70. So the person who can be the president of the Winners Chapel must be that top senior minister, just like the Church of Pentecost. They have that similarity. Now, when it comes to the nominations, in the Church of Pentecost, you are nominated by the executive council, chaired by the incumbent chairman. You understand? So the Church of Pentecost has two main councils at the administrative level of the church worldwide. The executive council and the general council. The executive council is made up of the chairman, the general secretary, the international missions director, one apostle, prophet or national head elected from Africa who is not a Ghanaian by descent, one apostle, prophet or national head elected from the nations outside of Africa, then 10 others elected from the apostles and prophets in Ghana. The council may co-opt a regional coordinator who is not a member of the executive council to its meetings. The executive council is responsible for the administration of the ministry while the general council is the highest policy making body of the church made up of all apostles, prophets, evangelists and ordained pastors of the church, area executive committee members, national heads, national deacons, national secretaries, trustees, chairman of boards and committees, and ministry directors, national executive committee members of ministries, national ITI PENSA coordinating committee, area women's ministry leaders in Ghana, specialists, retired ministers, and other persons may be invited to attend without voting rights. Now, when it comes to Winners Chapel, the executive council, they also have an executive council, is the highest policy making body, unlike the Church of Pentecost, which is the general council in the Winners Chapel, it is the executive council, which is actually the highest policy making body made up of the president, who is the chairman and the founder of the ministry currently. But in the absence of the founder, in the absence of the founder, it's going to be chaired by the president. Then you have the first vice president, then the other vice president, then you have the mandate secretary, mission secretary, educational secretary, directors, secretary, and special assistants, heading directories and departments. The, then it is followed by the cabinet. The cabinet is the operational arm of the executive council chaired by the first vice president. The central management board is responsible for driving and monitoring implementation of general operations and is composed of the mandate secretary for general administration, the secretary of the president who is a liaison officer in the office of the president, mission secretary who monitors and administers missions operations for both home and foreign missions and a few others. Then you have the educational secretary, director of finance, director of publishing. These are the components of the central management board. Now, what do you learn from all this? These two ministries have well laid down structures. They have seen various operational lapses and operational points, and they have kept leaders in charge in order to foster all their operations very well, in order to make all their operations running very smoothly. Now, in most young ministries, these things are not in sight. Majority of young ministries are run by a one person. He is everything. He makes all the decisions. He is the head of all the councils. He is the head of everything and runs everything by himself. Now, if you learn from this, which is an example from what um, Jethro gave to Moses, you will get to understand that ministry is not designed to be run by one person. You are supposed, even in the New Testament, must have a group of elders with which the activities of the ministries are governed and run.
And so something to be learned from here. And I would advise that you go check the document so that it will give you a clue of some of the things you can do. You don't need to do the same things, but it can give you an example of something that you can learn from. Now let's come to the succession plans and we are going to dwell with the Church of Pentecost first. Then we'll come back to the Winners Chapel. So the first thing is that to get a new chairman, the executive council regulating its own proceedings. And remember, the executive council is chaired by the incumbent chairman. Shall after prayerful consideration present a candidate from the list of eligible candidates to the electoral college for open discussion and secret ballots. Now, members of the executive council, apostles, prophets, evangelists, national heads, and area heads shall constitute an electoral college to put forward a candidate for the chairmanship to be voted upon by the general council. The elections at the electoral college is done by a secret ballot supervised by an electoral commission that is appointed by the executive council. Elections at the electoral college shall be by simple majority. The candidates so elected are the at the electoral college shall be presented to the general council for approval by two test majority votes of the members present now when it comes to the voting if the candidate so presented fails to obtain the required two test majority votes from the general council the electoral college shall nominate a second candidate for approval by two test majority vote so when you are approved by the ele electoral college from the executive council and you are brought to the general council you are expected to have at least two third majorities which will mean that majority of the leadership of the church ordained ministers and heads of the ministries all love and are interested in the person that has been submitted to them the moment you don't get two thirds they are going to present another person if the second candidate also fails to obtain the two thirds majority votes from the general council the electoral college shall nominate a third candidate for approval by two thirds majority votes of members present and still in the voting if the third candidate presented by the electoral college also fails to obtain the two thirds majority votes then the two candidates who drew the highest number of votes shall be presented to the general council for election on simple majority basis where there is a tie it shall be resolved by casting of lots basically so you must get to test at the general council at the general council you have all these ordained ministers and people who are into the ministry actively voting and if you don't get to test it means that they are not really interested in you and i think this is remarkable and so it makes it possible for no chairman to impose people on the church you cannot impose anybody on the church because at least the person is not going to be expected to get simple majority vote of 50 percent. you are supposed to get at least two thirds which means that people should know you people should believe in you and people should be able to trust you for you to get that amount of vote and the moment you get such numbers it means that majority of the people are with you and majority of the people support you and so you'll be able to be a successful chairman imagine a system where you can impose a chairman on the people where majority of the people do not support what is going to happen is that he's going to be fought he's going to be resisted all the time that he's going to be chairman and things are not going to augur well for the church and so i believe this is something remarkable that is being done by the church of pentacles now when they have their chairman he's supposed to hold the office for a term of five years and then he may be re-elected for a further term only that he shall not be elected to hold office more than two times so when the five-year tenure comes to an end he can be voted again now what happens in the absence in capacitation or death of the chairman a number of things will happen during the absence or incapacitation of the chairman the executive council shall appoint an acting chairman and it's supposed to be for a period of one year in case of death the general council shall appoint a chairman within three months from the date of the death of the chairman within that space of three months it should be done now when it comes to deep disciplinary action should the chairman abuse his office or do things that brings disrepute to the church what shall be done these are all spelled out it shall be the duty of the executive council to interdict him and appoint an independent body within the church to go into the matter and i like it an independent body within the church you don't need outsiders to judge the issues of the church 
So an independent body within the church will be assigned to investigate the matter to see whether he is actually guilty or he is not. According to the constitution and principles of the church, the body so appointed shall report to the executive council within three months. Now, if the chairman is found guilty and the seriousness of the offense so requires, the executive council shall give him a written notice of his removal from the office forthwith. So you can see, the chairman does not have absolute powers when he is in the wrong. After being investigated, the executive council can interdict him and also can remove him. Now, during the period of interdiction, an acting chairman shall be appointed by the executive council. So if you do something wrong, you are interdicted. Whilst you are being investigated, somebody will be in charge. Now, he is also at liberty to appeal if he thinks he is innocent. The chairman shall have a right to appeal to the general council within one month of the date he served of his removal. Then the decision of the general council shall be final because we said the general council is the highest decision making body. So the general council will decide whether you are truly acquitted or you are guilty and then their decision is going to be final is this not amazing now when it comes to the winners chapel international the presidency is with the founder for a lifetime except otherwise decided by him until he exits he is going to be the president and the founder for a lifetime then if the president decides to vacate or to be relieved of his office based on personal, physical or health or even social reasons, he shall, after consultation with the executive council of the church, file a notice to the board of trustees at least a year before the proposed exit. So if he wants to exit in 2026, he must a year before that exit, 2025, a year before that exit, he is supposed to have, in consultation with the executive, executive council, file a notice to the board of trustees at least a year before the proposed date. So the board of trustees is the legal team of the church. It's a 12-member board with a chairman, vice chairman, then a secretary, then nine others. And must be for you to qualify to be part of the board of trustees, you must be a pastor for over 20 years or a member for more than 25 years so basically they are also senior members and ministers of the church who are appointed independently to the board of trustees in order to in order to foster checks and balances within the ranks of the church so the board of trustees will indicate the approval or otherwise of the notification not later later than three months upon receipt the moment you file your notice of exit they will check it then Within three months, they are going to inform of their approval or otherwise. Then, after this, the existing president will be required to seek the face of God to nominate a successor into the office of the president to the board of trustees. Now, this is where it is quite different from the Church of Pentecost. Now, with the Church of Pentecost, though the chairman is the head of the executive council, and so he may have some superior powers in the appointment of his successor, over here, the president shall be required to seek the face of God to nominate the successor by himself into the office of the president, then given to the board of trustees. Now, should there be any objection with the board of trustees, there must be cogent and proven reasons. They must give clear reasons. Then, should the choice after due spiritual consideration not be acceptable, the hesitant president will be given a second chance to nominate another candidate within three weeks of rejection of the earlier nomination. Then, the board of trustees shall be expected to complete screening in the four weeks that follow they are given four weeks to screen and to finish the new nominee now where the second nominee is also rejected the board of trustees shall in conjunction with the executive council of the chair take full spiritual responsibility for the installation of a new president so in this case the editing president after the rejection of the second nominee will not be allowed to choose another successor so then the board of trustees in conjunction with the executive council will now be responsible for the new successor now that is where it is a little like the church of Pentecost. so now the board of trustees who are independent of the executive council 
will now be responsible for the new chairman so for example let's create an hypothetic situation so today if bishop oedepo should nominate a successor and he says okay i'm going to choose oedepo david oedepo jr to be my successor it will be in the capacity of the board of trustees to accept or to reject him now he is currently also the chairman of the board of trustees which means that he will will some power there so he'll be able to have his way do you understand but unlike the church of pentacles if you nominate somebody within the executive council and because you are the chairman of the executive council you even have your way all the leaders of the church will have to now come and vote and you need to tell in order to be in order to be approved as the new chairman and in the winner's chapel case as the new president and so with bishop oedepo it is likely he can have his way to have a successor because he's the head of the board of trustees also and be able to put the successor that he wants so in this in his absence that the new president will not be able to force a new successor upon the church i don't know whether you get it because the new president after the new president after bishop oedepo will not be a member of the board of trustees who have the responsibility to approve or reject the successor that is presented by the president do you get it so that is the possible scenario that could happen now now let's move on the event of the sudden exit of an incumbent president say the president died without choosing a successor the board of trustees shall be responsible or shall have the responsibility of consecrating a new president drawn from two nominations submitted by the executive council so here the vice presidents will now plus the mandate secretary and all the other people that are part of the executive council shall submit two nominations where neither of the nominees are considered suitable for that exalted office the board of trustees takes responsibility and seek the face of god for guidance to identify and consecrate a new president that means the board of trustees has the authority has the power the mandate to certify appoint or authenticate anybody that the executive council presents now i like this part when any incumbent has attained the age of 65 he ceases to be president so whenever any incumbent has attained the age of 65 he's going to cease to be president so the only person who is supposed to be president over the age 65 is the founder because the presidency is going to be with him for a lifetime but anybody who reaches 65 as president will cease to be president but the board of trustees will now identify candidate for the office of the president by appointing the next president following the procedures that we have talking about already the president must submit nominate people that can take the place of the presidency subject to the approval of the board of trustees now the other thing about the presidency is that a new president must not be more than 58 at the time of installation with a seven-year tenure not renewable except by the board of trustees now this is the place where many people think okay so the agenda is to set a constitution and a mandate in a way that the current crop of leaders with him cannot um, be president after him because all of them would have crossed 58 and in fact majority of them are now in their 60s and so automatically they are all disqualified the current vice presidents are all disqualified except david oedepo jr and so people think it's an agenda to promote and to push him into that space but i think he also has a reason for that he says that being a leader you must have the drive to push the ministry to the next level you shouldn't be an old man like some of the african president you see around who just go to events to sleep and are not having the energy and the drive to push the ministry forward and so there's another clause he says that the board of trustees and the executive council when they perceive a loss of drive in the president shall request a step down so in the church of pentacles scenario when you commit an offense you can be interdicted and made to step down in a winner's chapel situation you are not just supposed to do something wrong even if you show a lack of drive for the assignment for the mandate for the commission you are supposed to be made to step down 
Do you understand? Now, what is the criteria for the president of the Winners Chapel? We've looked at it in bits and pieces, but let's categorize all of them here. He said it must be a pastor for at least 20 years and must not be more than 58 at the time of installation. He must be spiritual. He must be exemplary. He must be drawn from the council of priests. He must have a good family testimony. He must have financial integrity. He must have proven leadership grace. He, that means he must have been a senior leader of the ministry. Now, thinking about all these things, I think these structures are remarkable. They are great pieces of documents that every charismatic Pentecostal new ministry fellowship leaders across Africa must copy and learn from. Now, you don't have to tell us exactly as it is here, but look at the important points. Look at the structures. Look at the things that you can adopt and adapt to that can let people take over the ministry if you are not here today. Now, imagine your sudden demise. I know many of us do not expect to die, but tomorrow, if we don't find you among those of us ministering on the earth now, what is going to become of your ministry? What have you written down? What is the procedure and the protocol the church is going to follow in order to put a new leader? Do you have anything like that? Now, if you don't have, this is the time to start burning the midnight candle to go through all these documents and put something down. Draft your constitution, draft the order of services, draft the succession plans, draft all the portfolios and positions in the ministry and their specific roles and also their terms of reference it is not just about you it is for continuity it's so that tomorrow the ministry shall be enduring god bless you i hope you learn something from this this is part of the things that we can do to end the charismatic pyramid schemes but in all these things make sure that the systems you put in place is one that will glorify god is one that will not be self-centered is one that is going to ensure that in the long run the purpose of God is fulfilled and the purpose of God is followed. God bless you. This is Pastor Gideon. I'll see you in the next one. Shalom.